Israel versus Hamas, what to know. Israel will seek to eliminate the threat posed by the Palestinian militant group for good. But its campaign in Gaza could draw in other adversaries, including Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda. How sophisticated was Hamas's attack on Israel? It is completely unprecedented that a terrorist organization would have the capacity or the wherewithal to mount coordinated, simultaneous assaults from the air, sea, and land. In addition, Hamas possessing the ability to keep its preparations unknown from a country like Israel that has among the most sophisticated intelligence services in the world strongly suggests that it had external state support, advice, and guidance in the planning and execution of the attack on Israel. Iran, accordingly, will be strongly suspected of being behind this. Iran already provides both Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad PIJ, with at least $100 million per year, and it openly proclaims its intention to destroy Israel. Further, in recent months, Tehran was clearly growing concerned over the potential for Saudi Arabia and Israel to establish formal diplomatic relations, and even more so of a Saudi-US defense pact. So Iran had every reason to encourage and facilitate the attack on Israel. However, that is very different from actually ordering, much less orchestrating the assaults or giving any form of green light. While Hamas and PIJ, like the Lebanon-based Hezbollah, have close ties with Iran, they also function independently. That said, Iran's long track record of seeking to destabilize countries across the region, including Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait, Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia, is also very well documented. The Hamas attack has changed everything. This was not supposed to happen. Israel's vaunted military and ruthlessly efficient security services had Hamas bottled up in the Gaza Strip. Sure, every few years there was a conflict that followed a similar pattern. A provocation, Hamas rocket attacks, Israeli airstrikes, Egyptian mediation, and then quiet again. Meanwhile, Israel's diplomatic achievements piled up as it expanded its circle of peace to include the new United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. Until a few days ago, Washington was debating when Saudi Arabia and Israel would normalize relations. That was when people began getting news alerts on their devices, informing them that Hamas had invaded Israel, killing many civilians and soldiers, and had yet to be subdued while a salvo of anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 rockets rained down on Ashkelon, Ashdod, and Tel Aviv. By now, whatever has been said about Hamas's Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, as this latest assault has been dubbed, that it's unprecedented, a quantum leap, Israel's 9-11, has become cliché. However folks want to describe it, it should be clear that the merciless lethality of Hamas's invasion of Israel has, at the risk of another cliché, changed everything. The familiar pattern of Israel-Hamas conflict is now something of the past. There is simply no way the Israeli government will not unleash the Israel Defense Forces, or IDF, on the Gaza Strip on the ground, in the air, and by sea to destroy Hamas and, in the process, kill or capture leaders such as Ismail Haniya and Mohammed Daif. As a result, the issues that the world of Middle East experts, punditry, and officialdom was concerned with just a week ago Israel's eligibility for the U.S. visa waiver program and the prospect of Saudi-Israeli normalization suddenly seems irrelevant. The starting point for the new Middle East will be an Israeli reoccupation of the Gaza Strip, not an Israeli embassy in Riyadh. What type of military operation is Israel likely to undertake? As Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has promised, it will be both massive and will seek to be decisive with the intention of permanently destroying Hamas. Until this war's wanton execution of civilians, rape of Jewish women, and dragging of women, children, the elderly, and infirmed into captivity, there could have been at least the same modicum of restraint and playing by the rules as in past fighting between Israel and Hamas, such as during Operation Cast Lead in 2008 and the Gaza Wars of 2014 and 2021. The objective in each of those was to degrade Hamas's military capabilities, eliminate as many of its political and military leaders as was reasonably attainable, and buy time in terms of warding off future fighting by weakening the organization and diminishing its weapons stockpiles, especially missiles. 
However, at least according to what is being reported, Hamas and PIJ fighters have committed and are still committing a vast array of what can only be described as war crimes. The reports of executions, sexual abuse, civilians being pulled from their homes and other depredations will not go unpunished by Israel. As more of this information comes to light and as the shock of the initial attack fades, Israelis will demand revenge. A common argument about counterterrorism is that there is no military solution. But that's not completely true, provided that a country does not care about harming civilians. For instance, the Sri Lankan military's campaign in 2009 completely crushed the Tamil Tigers. An estimated 20,000 civilians were killed along with the Tigers' founder and leader, his entire command staff, and virtually all the organization's officers and rank and file. A terrorist group can be destroyed in this way, but it comes with a tremendous loss of civilian lives. If Israel were to pursue this objective, a number of things would likely follow, including Hezbollah coming to Hamas's aid or Iran potentially becoming involved, with the possible convergence of foreign fighters from Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, among other groups. That would launch this conflict into a different trajectory altogether. Hamas and Israel at war, what we know on day four. Death toll rises as Israeli military says Hamas has nowhere to hide after launching airstrikes across Gaza. The Israeli military said on Tuesday that Hamas's operatives had nowhere to hide in Gaza and that its air force was carrying out intensive airstrikes in waves every four hours. We will reach them everywhere, Chief Military Spokesman Daniel Hagari said in a briefing. The Israeli Air Force has announced on social media that it is launching an extensive attack against terror targets of the terrorist organization Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The UN Human Rights Chief said on Tuesday that Israeli air operations had struck residential buildings, including tower blocks, as well as schools and UN buildings across Gaza, resulting in civilian casualties. Gaza's health ministry has put Palestinian casualty figures at at least 770 killed and 4,000 wounded by Israeli airstrikes since Saturday. They additionally claim that at least another 18 people were killed and 100 injured in the West Bank since Saturday. Israeli media reports that Hamas fighters killed about 900 people inside Israel during the weekend incursion. Israel has retaken control of the Gaza border fence breached by Palestinian Hamas gunmat the weekend and is planting mines in the parts where the barrier was toppled, the chief military spokesperson said on Tuesday. Hagari said there had been no new infiltrations from Gaza since Monday. The Times of Israel reports that officers are preparing to inform 100 families that their loved ones have been taken hostage by Hamas and are being held in Gaza. A senior member of the militant group has said it intends to use the dozens of hostages being held in Gaza to secure the release of Palestinians detained in Israel and overseas. The Israeli Air Force confirmed it had flown back hundreds of IDF soldiers who were abroad in order to contribute to the IDF's efforts to mobilize additional forces to continue fighting. The UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly said he was sure that Israel was focused exclusively on destroying Hamas and Gaza and not on attacking Palestinians in general or the wider Arab world. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said Iran was not involved in the Hamas attack on Israel but hailed what he called Israel's irreparable military and intelligence defeat. We kiss the hands of those who planned the attack on the Zionist regime, Khamenei said in his first televised speech since the attack. The Zionist regime's own actions are to blame for this disaster, he added. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, said the comments were unacceptable. The Spanish acting foreign minister, José Manuel Álvarez, said on Tuesday his government opposed the proposed suspension of EU aid to Palestinians. This cooperation must continue. We cannot confuse Hamas, which is in the list of EU's terrorist groups, with the Palestinian population or the Palestinian Authority or the UN organization on the ground, Álvarez said in an interview with Spanish radio. His views were echoed by France's foreign ministry, which issued a statement in Paris this morning saying, we are not in favor of suspending aid that directly benefits the Palestinian people. The French foreign ministry has announced that four French nationals have died in the attacks. Thirteen French nationals are still missing and their situation was considered very worrying, the ministry said. Spain has said two of its citizens are still missing. 
Austria is arranging an evacuation of its citizens from Israel by military transport aircraft on Wednesday, Chancellor Karl Niehammer said. Cyprus has said it is ready to help with the evacuation of nationals from third countries who might want to leave Israel. Eighteen Thais have been killed in the conflict, the kingdom's government said on Tuesday, up from the previous toll of 12. A foreign ministry spokesperson said nine Thai citizens had been wounded and 11 taken hostage. About 30,000 Thais work in Israel. Russia's deputy foreign minister, Sergei Ryabkov, has said Moscow and Washington have not been in contact over the escalation of the conflict. The Palestine football team is withdrawn from a tournament in Malaysia. It had been scheduled to compete in the Merdeka Cup in Malaysia from 13 to 17 October. Israel's Euro 2024 qualifier against Switzerland, which was due to be played on Thursday, has already been postponed. What are some of the advantages and challenges for Hamas and Israel? Hamas exploited the advantage of surprise with astonishing success. Its advantage now is the ability to scatter and hide within the protective shield of Gaza's civilian population. Also, as an authoritarian regime that has not held elections in Gaza for 15 years, it can coerce the population into cooperation and does not have to worry about public opinion. Israel's advantages should have thwarted Hamas's surprise attack. Israel has one of the most technologically sophisticated, best-trained, well-armed and professional militaries in the region, if not the world, at least given Israel's small size. The advanced armaments, doctrine, training and equipment of the Israel Defense Forces have endowed it with formidable fighting capabilities that will become increasingly evident in the coming days. In terms of disadvantages, Hamas is a terrorist organization and, at least historically, terrorist organizations have fared poorly when the full weight of an established state's military might is brought to bear on it. For Israel, the preeminent disadvantage is the hundreds of captives seized by Hamas. Many are dual nationals, including American citizens, so Israel's efforts to free the hostages will become even more complex. The captives have likely already been dispersed throughout the Gaza Strip, an area about the size of Washington, D.C. Gaza is riven with tunnels, bunkers, and other concealed places that will make locating, much less rescuing, the hostages difficult. These places, and perhaps even the hostages themselves, will likely be laden with traps. This is a challenge of a magnitude that has never been faced before. How this crisis will end is anyone's guess, but the shedding of more innocent blood, Israeli, Palestinians, and indeed non-combatant citizens of other countries, is certain. What are some things to look for as this unfolds over the coming days? This conflict is far from over, and it's completely unpredictable as to how it will progress. Powerful centrifugal forces have been unleashed that have rewritten the rules for Israel and Hamas and perhaps others in the region. For instance, given Hezbollah's long-standing ties with Hamas and the fact that their mutual state patron has an immense interest in ensuring the longevity of its regional terrorist clients, Hezbollah will, of its own accord, but completely in sync with Iran's wishes, likely enter the war if Israel launches a ground assault in Gaza. The consequences will then be enormous. This happened during the summer of 2006, when clashes between Israel and Hamas triggered Hezbollah attacks in the north. During the 2006 Lebanon War, Hezbollah had an arsenal of about 15,000 missiles, the most sophisticated provided by Iran and Syria, and wreaked havoc on the north of Israel. Today, Hezbollah has an arsenal of missiles believed to be 10 times that, which are both more accurate and can travel greater distances the entirety of Israel would then be vulnerable to missile attacks. Thus, there is every possibility of the war spreading, and the terrible bloodshed and tragedies, especially to the civilian populations, that will follow will make any kind of talks more fraught and more distant than in the past. In addition, Palestinian militants in the West Bank could rise up with violence at any moment, though this would be more likely if Israel were to launch a major ground attack and reoccupy Gaza. That would then raise the question. Confronted by a three-front war, would Israel then target Iran in hopes of pressuring it to call off its minions?